I know we do it every week, but we definitely need to pray before we talk about that one. Will you join me with a word, in a word of prayer? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On Monday of this week, a group of about eight of us met here at the church with Reverend Dr. Eric Smith. He is a biblical scholar, a professor at Iliff School of Theology, and like me, an ordained Disciples of Christ pastor who serves a UCC church. He's the teaching minister at First Plymouth UCC, and he's also a friend of mine. So when our Sunday morning dig group, who meets at 9 a.m. on Sundays, starting again on September 11th, and all are welcome to join us as we dig deeper into our faith, starting again on September 11th, when they were making a decision about what they would read last spring, along with our conversations with Scripture group, who meets Tuesdays at 1 p.m., all are welcome. And they too were deciding what to read. They all agreed to read Eric's book called Paul the Progressive and to read it together with the promise that he would come speak to us and answer our questions after our reading. And so we finally had made that happen this past Monday, and there were a lot of good questions and insights shared by our different groups and by Eric. But one thing that he said just stuck with me. The basis of this book we read is a reclaiming of Paul for progressive Christians who sometimes dismiss a lot of Paul's writings. But in our conversation on Monday, we spoke a little bit about biblical authority, how much power and authority we give to Scripture. And in that conversation, Eric said something like there are passages that we reject or passages we might just have to walk away from or reject outright. And he said, and that is okay. So when I turned to this text that Anne just read for us, my thought was, wow. I could just say no to this text. I could just leave it alone. Jesus coming to bring not peace, but division, hatred against between family members. That's not what anyone wants to hear about. And it has been, this text has been misused to support terrible acts of violence. I could just say no. I could walk away. Not that Eric has any power over my relationship with Scripture, but something about his permission to reject a part of Scripture felt liberating and allowed me to approach this text not because I had to, but instead I had to decide if I wanted to. And I found out that I did want to. I wanted to argue with Jesus. I decided I wasn't just willing to let this go, chalk it up to Jesus having a bad day. I was going to ask him what in the world he was doing when he said, do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? Yeah, Jesus, that's exactly what we think. I want to say to him, maybe you were too small to remember, but when you were born, there was a whole bunch of angels and they said exactly that you are absolutely supposed to bring peace on earth and good will to all. I don't know everything, but I know my Christmas carols. And you would do well, Jesus, to remember them too. I, maybe I would ask him, is this some text that got lost from your teenage years? Like, I'm not going to do what you say. I'm bringing division. And then he goes into the whole thing about family members against each other, hating each other in some translations. Now, in his days, families were different, thought of differently than they are now, but just as important, if not more so. Your family was your identity, your trade, your location, and your loyalty. And so I wanted to find out what is he doing here and not just give up and walk away from this text. Now, maybe that whole idea is a problem for you. You might disagree with Eric entirely, that you can just say no to parts of the Bible that you find problematic. Or maybe your relationship with Scripture would lead you not to know anyone, know why anyone would question rejecting part of Scripture. Of course we make choices when reading, and some things you choose to walk away from. The group who met on Monday morning was not of all, of all one accord on this, 
And of course, neither are those of us gathered in person or gathered online. But the thing for me was feeling like I could allowed me a freedom in which to engage this text. And after doing so, I think it might be one of my favorites. This passage that we have heard might be Jesus' most human moment that we read throughout all of the Gospels, or at least the most relatable. More so than when he cries in grief at Lazarus' death, or when he is chided by the Syrophoenician woman after he calls her and her daughter a dog, more than when he gets mad and turns over tables, maybe even more so when he cries out in fear and grief, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he says, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, what stress I am under until it is completed. And then that line, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Here in this raw moment, he tells his disciples he is stressed about the path, not only that he is on, which is quickly approaching Jerusalem and the cross, but also the path that his message inaugurated. It's not that he is regretting his ministry, but that he is living in the midst of the ramifications of it and seeing where the words that he says and the actions that he does are leading. What he is doing here is telling the truth. And it's a truth that no one wants to hear. Now he comes by this truth telling honestly, only a little bit of a pun intended, because Jesus follows a long line of truth tellers. That's what the Bible is, particularly the prophets. They utter unpopular truths that people need to hear. The people don't want to hear them, but they need to hear them so they can do the work of changing course and reconciling with each other and ultimately with God. It's not an easy thing telling the truth. And Jesus says how stressful it is. Scholars agree, though, that what he is saying is descriptive and not prescriptive. Jesus isn't changing the story. He isn't contradicting the angels or his own call for love of neighbor and God and self. He is instead naming the reality of what radical love and thereby justice looks like when met by an unjust world. Let me say that again. Jesus is not prescribing what we should do, but describing what happens when radical love and justice are met by an unjust world. Well, there is plenty about Jesus and his work and call that feels good and beautiful and unifying. So, too, the kingdom he inaugurates that we continue to co-create will not come without pain and division. We know the beautiful truth that love is the most powerful force in the world, but that doesn't mean it comes without suffering and struggle. That's always been true. We just don't want it to be true. We want simple and easy, so Jesus tries to make things a little lighter as he continues on in the text. So he talks about the weather. When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain. I laughed out loud when I was reading this because I always think of weather as the safest of topics. Even with my most difficult family members, the weather is usually a safe place to land to avoid hard conversations. Sure, yep, it sure is hot out. But now with climate change and the deniers thereof, even weather is off the table. But Jesus uses the safe aspect of weather to prove his point. He says, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? As I read this, it's hard for me not to wrap my it's hard for me to wrap my mind around this passage being true for any time as much as it is true for us right now. It's hard to imagine this ever feeling as relevant as it does in this moment. Right now, when we can't even talk about the weather. 
Right now, when I was nervous about using this text at all because it was also used by those waving Christian flags outside the Capitol on January 6th, how could this passage have been as true as it is now when family members have divided over things as big as protecting the earth and as little as masks and everything in between? We know about division, and we don't want Jesus to be in the middle of it. We want him to get us out of this mess. But honestly, I think that's what he is saying. He isn't happy in this text. I wish it were already kindled doesn't mean burn it down. Instead, it sounds like grief. I want to get through this and get to the healing. But Jesus knows there are no shortcuts. That is who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't sidestep. He doesn't sidestep the cross, and neither can we plug our ears or live in such a vacuum that we ignore the division and the struggle, all that is this present time. Because ultimately, the present is all we have. And we don't want to be in conflict with our mothers and daughters, fathers and sons and in-laws. Division doesn't seem like it is getting us anywhere except more divided. But in that first line, as hostile as it sounds, there is still hope. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. What stress I am under until it is completed. There is another side to this. Fire throughout scripture of course, is a thing of destruction, but not destruction for destruction's sake, but instead a way of refining a metal to take away that which pollutes it, that which prevents it from being and shining with all of the beauty it was created to have. Even a wildfire with the destruction we know all too well is also a needed part of nature so that the ground can be fertilized and grow anew. I might have mentioned before a book I read during my sabbatical last summer called Big Friendship. The premise of this book is about these two women who became friends as adults. They connected quickly and their relationship had all the trust and playfulness and depth that a best friendship should have. They even eventually started a podcast so they had a business together but then at some point things started to get harder. There were misunderstandings, there was anger, there was hurt. They started to withdraw from one another, but they had invested a lot into this friendship. So basically, they went to couples therapy. They were not romantically involved, and that is the point of the book, or the most important point that I took from it. In our friendships, as opposed to romantic relationships, when things get hard, we tend to just drift away from each other. We can keep the title of friend even when we don't really like each other and certainly don't trust each other anymore. There are rarely named breakups that you announce between friends. You just avoid the conflict and subtly walk away. But what a big friendship is, as these two women explained, was a friendship worth fighting in and fighting for. They refuse, to, they, they refuse to allow the other to be a phase or a distant friend that they just put on a Christmas card list and otherwise moved on from. They were committed to doing the work, and the work, the hardest work, was fighting with each other, naming how they were hurt, hearing how they hurt the other, putting in the time and the effort and the discomfort and the anger and the grief and the guilt and all of the other emotions in order to find a path forward, in order to remain in relationship. And that path forward wasn't a wonderful, happy ending that all was forgiven and they lived happily ever after because they are human And humans in a relationship, because friendship is a relationship, and relationships are hard. Striving for what we know is good between two people and between all people will not come to us without conflict, without difficult emotions and times of trial. And that is what Jesus 
is saying to us. His way, his way of love and justice and kingdom building will not be sunshine and roses. It will not always feel good. It will cut to the very depth of our relationships and identity as we try to live a life faithful to our neighbors and our God and ourselves every day. And when we tell the stories that they all lived happily ever after, or when we make the Bible out to be some nice fairy tale, it is obvious that, as Jesus said, we do not know how to interpret the present time. Because this life and this call to follow Jesus is difficult. I tend to take so much comfort in Dr. King's vision that the arc of the universe bends, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. But for our grandmothers who worked for reproductive rights to see it overturned for 50 years later, it just doesn't seem that simple. And it isn't. Because it is true that Jesus came to be, bring peace on earth and division is a part of that story too. The relationships that give us the most joy and groundedness and sense of belonging are also the ones worth fighting for, which means we must be willing to go through conflict, struggle, pain, and stress for that relationship. And that isn't just some uncomfortable reality. It's actually essential to building a big friendship, a big relationship, to go through the conflict and the division. That's not a bad thing. It can be bad, of course. Broken relationships and conflict can be toxic or even dangerous. But healthy conflict that remembers the relationship and the humanity of others, even in the midst of conflict, those can transform individuals as well as our very world. What if instead of hiding from conflict, we embraced it, moved not away, but toward it? I heard a while back about a tradition from several generations ago in Uganda called unhappiness courts. Within a tribe, there were people called Abu Bakas who would go around into the various communities and listen. They were charged with conflict resolution, and they would often hear things that they would refer to as teenage conflict, one that was reasonably small, but the Abu Bakas would listen and pay attention to how those teenage conflicts might grow or when the story got bigger or bigger as lies began to be woven in to the original conflict they had heard about. And they were very mindful as these stories grew and as these conflicts grew to include more than just the two original people. And when a conflict grew to a place that they needed to be addressed, the Abu Bakas would call the community together. They would call them together in a ritual that they called unhappiness courts. A collective ritual, they would begin, the Abu Bakas would lead it, and they would begin with dancing, as was true in their custom as a form of celebration, but all times when they gathered together in sacred places as community. And so they would dance together, and that dancing would transition to a song. The Abu Bakas would sing the song, the story of the conflict, because they were able to hear the root of the conflict and not all the lies that it had birthed. So they would sing the conflict, which would be collectively witnessed, and then they would offer a closing ritual. So there's dancing, and then there's singing of the moment that this conflict was born. Not with all of the lies, not with all of the baggage, not he said, she said, or one person's version of the story that goes on longer than the others. The Abu Bakas would name the story as they heard it surrounded by both those in the conflict and those beyond it, all in the community together. And then there was a closing ritual as they moved out of that space. And there was healing. They didn't hide from conflict. They placed the truth in the center and allowed it to be seen as sacred and allowed healing and honesty to come forth. And so when Jesus says this thing, do you think that I come to bring peace? No, but rather division. I hear him naming the conflict, placing it in the center, 
and telling us to hold this as sacred, just as sacred as love your neighbor and do justice and love kindness. The reality that his message will be met with division cannot be overlooked or ignored or pushed to the side. And so whether or not I always like it, whether or not it is easy, while I have permission now to ignore a part of the Bible, all of that is sacred. Scripture is our sacred text, and for me it is worth fighting for. I have a big relationship with the Bible. Likewise with the church. We might not always love church, be it this church or the church universal, but maybe it is important enough to have a big relationship, to fight with it and for it. The same for you, for all of you and so many of our relationships. We want this life of faith. We want community for its joy and inspiration and beauty and love and peace. But we might just learn as much, maybe more. We might grow deeper when we are honest about the present time. Because conflict just is. And from it, and through it, and with it, and eventually, by the grace of God, through and beyond it, we build the kingdom in us and around us. And I believe that so much, I'm willing to fight you on it. Amen.